So Tamara and I met in an elevator a couple of <laughs> a couple of months ago in February in Miami. And uh, I started telling her about Most Powerful Women. And literally, I think we were 10 minutes into our conversation, and you said, I'd love to come. So thank you for being here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yes. So this weekend, actually yesterday, how many people, I, I, I shouldn't do this, how many people have read In My Shoes, Tamara's book that she wrote? A thank number you. of people. <laughs> More people need to read it. Um, it is a rollicking, in, incredibly candid book about a woman who has lived a life and lived to tell about it. Tamara, I'm going to ask you, first of all, to try in four sentences, what is the elevator pitch about your life? Um, a woman who faces adversity uh, and per perseveres and triumphs. <laughs> If I was going to make it up. You have done that. <laughs> um, Tamara was uh, an ex the accessories editor for Vogue here in London uh, from 1990, 1990 to 1995 when she met a... Um, a shoemaker, a cobbler, a corner cobbler named Jimmy Choo. And um, she, um, you left Vogue. Uh, you kind of got pu pushed out of Vogue, right? Yeah, I got fired. You got fired. <laughs> <laughs> she got fired. And what does a girl do when she's in her 20s and she gets fired? She starts a company. And she partnered with this man, this, 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 sort of single single store, you know, tiny store cobbler named Jimmy Choo, which turned out to be a, an adventure which Tamara never, um, uh, never imagined. And uh, you built a major company. You built a very large and famous company. What were the lessons, both good and bad, um, from your Jimmy Choo experience? Well, there are so many. So the number one lesson um, is if I could talk to my younger self, I would say um, speak up, learn to find your voice, um, and and basically and, and believe in yourself a bit more. Um, what I found when I was young, I didn't speak up enough. And when you say when you were young, are you talking about in your 20s and you had a partner who turned out to be a very difficult and dysfunctional partner and ended up selling his 50% stake to private equity, which put you in an awkward position where you had a series of private equity owners that really were not, none of them were good partners. How could you have spoken up or was your initial mistake picking the, picking the wrong partner? So my initial mistake was, so really, private equity came into the business because Jimmy sold his shares to them. If I, was, if I had realized then, I could have been my own private equity company. So I, the company was doing so well, I could have gone to the bank, borrowed the money, and bought him out. Mm -hmm. So what a lot of private equity companies did, they put debt against the company to buy shares, and we paid the interest on their debt. So why couldn't I have done that? Why couldn't I have borrowed money and had the company pay interest on the debt? So what happened with private equity, once they get in, then we got sort of tossed around like a sort of hot potato um, because they like to show a return to their investors. So we ended up going through the sale process every two to three years, which is incredibly disruptive for a business because suddenly the whole management team doesn't know what's going to happen and the new owner is going to come in and restructure this and fire me. Um, and then every time a new private equity owner comes in, they want, they're so EBITDA focused, which they're so p focused on profits that they're always cutting costs. Um, so everyone who worked at the brand is underpaid, overworked. Um, we had to cut quality in the end. So there was a lot of, lot of things, a lot of lessons I learned in, in that. And one thing when I look back really is, um, when they came in, you know, they never invested in the company. People always say, well, you had a private equity invest in your business. That helped you grow. Well, not really. They never actually put capital in the business. They just bought shares from each other. Mm. Um, and we actually grew the business from cash flow. But when I really look back at it, you know, they were, where, was the, where were the women in these private equity firms? You know, I didn't have one woman on my board. I had... 
um, guys who work for private equity firms, and that's like putting a, a, a bunch of women who have all been fashion editors on the board of Pirelli Tires and saying, hey guys, what do you think about this business? What should we do? You know, it's, you know, or trying to get a vegan to eat foie gras. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't make sense. So, Tamara ended up, um, a, a company called uh, Labelux, a Swiss luxury goods company, uh, bought Jimmy Choo for, what was it, 101 million pounds? Was no, it? They, bought, they bought the company for uh, 550 million pounds. Oh, 550 million pounds in 2011. And um, Tamara left. And uh, in Tamara's book is a letter to the, uh, to the board, I guess it's to the board of Labelux. And um, you said that you learned two things from, from, your, from your father. What were those two things? So he said to me, um, lawyers always ruin deals. And you should always tell the lawyer what you want and have them negotiate it. Don't let them lead the negotiation for you. Um, and the second thing was don't let accountants run your business. Mm -hmm. So, Tamara, the, the, the adventure con c continued as you had a, you had a, I guess, just a year non-compete, and that gave you a chance to think about what, you're, what you were going to do next. And um, Tamara now has the Tamara Mellon brand, where she has um, her choice of investors, including one member, at least one member of our most powerful woman community, Tori Birch, is, a, is an investor. And uh, there may be others, uh, others as well from our community. Um, what are the biggest things that you're doing differently besides choosing your own partners and investors very carefully? Um, well, one thing I'm most proud of, I now have a female CEO. Um, which is great. But what I've done with this business, I really thought about what does the next generation of luxury brands look like? Because nobody will build the next billion dollar business how I built Jimmy Choo. So the way we used to build businesses was through wholesale and retail. And that will never happen again with the retail environment in crisis, department stores are in free fall, and everybody's shopping online. Um, so this is a completely different business model, which is direct-to-consumer, digitally-led e-commerce business. Um, so the old thing of what I do is the way we make the shoes. That will never change. I make the shoes in Italy at Italian factories with a lot of still handwork in them, and that's, and that's what I really appreciate, the quality of the shoes. But the way we sell and distribute them is changed. So it's uh, just e-commerce, it's just tomorrowmelon.com. And what I don't do anymore is I don't design collections. Um, we just design new things and we put up new things every month that are season appropriate. Because what's really happened in the fashion industry is, which has been very damaging, is when fashion shows uh, were open to the customers, um, you know, that never used to happen. When I was a young editor going to fashion shows, the only people who went to fashion shows were press and buyers. And then the customers saw the product when it was on the shop floor and in a magazine at the same time. So it had this big reveal moment that was exciting. So this argument today where people say, well, don't you have to wait for luxury? But I'm like, no, the customer never waited. She used to see it and be able to go and buy it. Mm -hmm. So this, this idea of the fashion show being open to the public is, is very dangerous because we still, as an industry, take six months to deliver the product to the store. And you tried to work with retailers initially with your new business, and you had to pivot to online only, right? Yes, so I tried to do uh, Buy Now, Wear Now. I launched Buy Now, Wear Now in 2013, um, and I learned incredible lessons from, the, the, from trying to start that way, so it's very difficult to do it through a wholesale channel. Um, because a lot of executives um, in that channel did not see the digital revolution coming or didn't want to acknowledge that it was coming. Sort of Their idea of fast that fashion that. is still slow fashion. It's, yes. Um, and so they were really not set up to, to sell anything in that way. So what I did, I pivoted the business. Um, I pulled all my business out of wholesale um, and took it direct to consumer. 
And meanwhile, you were going through personal bankruptcy uh, during not, that time. Not personal. Not, ter <laughs> not, not personal. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that, that is so, yeah, so I, sorry. I blew it all in a year, no, Patty. Yeah. But there was there was there was a Chapter Eleven bankruptcy yeah. with your business. Yes, I'm very I'm very sorry. <laughs> yes. That that where private equity ended up coming in and giving you ten million dollars, uh, and now you have ten million dollars of NEA private equity uh, uh, VC money. money. VC, v VC money. money, which uh, is VC I'm, money. I'm, 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 splitting hairs here, but VC is slightly different to private equity. Um, and why is VC money safer than um, the so-called opportunists that private equity, you, you, can, you, you said private equity firms are? Because um, VC is venture capital money, and what they do is they uh, are used to startups. Uh -huh. So they're, they're not as risk adverse, uh -huh. um, and they really help you. So because they put seed money into a business, they really work alongside you. They have a different world view of, of how to build a business. They respect the founder. Uh -huh. They're v incredibly supportive. Um, so basically what NEA did, they helped me uh, write the business plan, they helped me uh, do a CEO search, um, and they, you don't have the pressure to show quick profits. Uh -huh. um, so they're more in it for the long term and helping you build the business rather than um, getting in and out in two years. Uh, who has a question? I have a question. Yes, wait for the mic and please identify yourself. Are there mic handlers here? Yes. There should be over here. Uh huh. Please identify yourself. Yes, just there. Br bring it over here, please. Uh huh. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Gusun Al Khaled. I'm from Kuwait. I'm the deputy CEO of Asiko Group. Um, my question is what is your background and your education that helped you manage the business initially when you partner up? And when you have the venture capital initially, were you in management level? And how many employees were there at the time? OK, so I'll try to remember all three. Um, so give, what was the first one? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Just sitting here. I like to break my it with a laugh. This is me. So I was education. Um, yes. My education. I was terrible in school, which I, I don't advocate for my daughter. I want you know my daughter to go to college and get. She wants to go and get an MBA. So I'm very proud of her. But I was terrible in school. I left school with no qualifications, um, and I didn't go to college. So I actually just started working on a shop floor when I was 18. And I'd actually worked in the fashion business for 10 years before I founded Jimmy Choo. So people think that you start a company, it's an overnight success. It's not actually. I'd worked in the business for 10 years. I, I um, worked for a PR company. I worked for Mirabella magazine. I worked for Vogue for five years. Um, so by the time I founded Jimmy Choo, I had a pretty good round knowledge of the industry and working with luxury product from uh, selling on the shop floor. So what I would advice I would give to if I was mentoring a young girl, I would say just work. Just make sure, what, even if it's not your dream job or what you want to do, you have to just work because things, you will think of ideas and things will come to you when you're just active. Um, so I think it's just incredib incredibly important just to work. Tamara's book is very, very candid. And it's not only revealing about what an entrepreneur who is building a brand goes through. And you really worked it and struggled. And it's incredibly impressive what you did during, this was 20 years ago. In fact, it was May of, of, of um, of 1997 when you got your first big, big, it was the spring of 1997 yeah. when you got your big order from, from Saks. And then, you know, and then Jimmy Choo got mentioned on Sex and the City and became part of the Oscars. And you built the brand culturally in a very beautiful way. But the struggle in Tamara's book is, is fascinating. And Tamara, came from a family with uh, an alcohol, uh, alcoholic, narcissistic mother and a father who was very strong. 
um, I think, a bit overwhelmed by the, situ uh, by, by the domestic situation. Uh, Tamara has two, two brothers. Uh, her father was a co-founder of Vidal Sassoon, who partnered with Vidal Sassoon to build his very successful business in the same way that Tamara partnered with a man named Jimmy Choo. Um, Tamara, you ended up marrying a man who uh, had an addiction problem. You've been through rehab. What is the lesson for getting through life, no matter what it throws at you, and forging on? How do you think, think about that? Um, well, you know what really motivated me when I was young was a little bit of fear was actually fear is, was the fire under me that kind of got me out of bed, thinking, oh my God, where is my life gonna end up if I don't do something hmm. about it? And, and having my own business was really a lot about my independence and my freedom, um, because I wanted to make my own money, so I was never dependent on my father or a husband, mm -hmm. um, and because I like to make my own decisions, and I think that's incredibly important for women to work no matter even a little bit, no matter what you do, because that gives you your independence. So I met Minty, Tamara's daughter, and Minty is in the audience or backstage? She, I think she's backstage. So Minty is here. Minty is 15. how old now? She's 15. She is absolutely lovely. And what do, you, what do you tell her in terms of life advice? So I tell her that obviously an education <laughs> is very important, um, and she's great at school. Uh, so she's, she, I'm very proud of her. She's pretty much a straight A student, which I was not like when I was her age. Um, and I say to her, you know, it's, you have to follow your passion. Um, and if you do that, the money will follow. Um, so it's incredibly important that you do what you're happy doing. And then I find that the sort of the money follows behind that. Um, and yeah, and it's, I think she's, and. It's about what is, whatever she's passionate at, I support her in. Do you still have fear that you're trying to get past? Um, yes, I think I probably still have something to prove. Mm -hmm. um, and what are you trying to prove now? I guess, in all honesty, I guess I'm trying to prove that Jimmy Choo wasn't an accident. Hmm. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yes, we have a question up front. Tamara, thank you so much for sharing your inspirational story. Um, my name is Anushka Ladz, I'm from MasterCard. Um, you gave birth to Jimmy Choo. How did you feel leaving? You talked about fear. How did you actually feel walking away from such an iconic brand? It was, you know, it was incredibly difficult, but by the time I'd been through four, um, well, three private equity deals and one and then final sale, I think I was just burnt out um, with it, and I think I'd mourned it while I was in it, when I saw uh, what was happening to the business that was beyond, was beyond my control at that point, because I didn't have a big enough equity. Um, so I think I mourned it before I left, and then by the time I left, I was, I was ready to go. And I had to make a decision at that point. I thought I either, I either leave now, and I start another company. I'm probably just young enough to do that. I could have stayed at Jimmy Choo, you know, five more years and made, you know, kind of ton more money. But I felt that I was selling my soul. That if I did, so if I did that, and I had to, I had to be happy within myself. Mona Bolarshi from Beirut. Uh, you said you wanted to prove. Proof to who? Yourself or to the world? I think it's probably a little bit of both. Okay. It beats me. <laughs> beats me. I because so I, I, I would feel very uncomfortable if it's just proving to yourself. Because we don't know, we, we pass that era of trying to prove to ourselves. We're convinced now. That is true. Tamara, you're proving it to the world. So thank you very much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you.